Good to go. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Call Me Crazy. Today, I'm really excited to welcome on Ben Ivey. He is um, a global speaker. He's actually spoken over 200 events. And what he does is he helps entrepreneurs who might be struggling with over being overwhelmed or procrastination, and he helps them be the best they can be. And we're really excited to pick your brain. Welcome to the show, Ben. Thank you so much for having me, Aaron and Michael. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. So I always like to ask, like, how did this get started? Because I, I always feel like the path to get to where you are today is never what anybody thinks. So how'd you get here? Sure. So I ran a couple of businesses before. I think my first business was when I was 13 years old and I was selling chocolate in school. And I don't know if you know these little Freddos, they're like these mini little chocolate things, but I remember selling them for like 20p. But unfortunately, my business got shut down after two weeks when one of the teachers saw 10p's and 20p's falling out my locker. So unfortunately, that was that was the first business that got shut down. Uh, I realized you had to have boundaries and follow the rules. And then from there, I ran uh, an important export business and then i ended up going to silicon valley and running an app oh nice and as i was there i was in the vr space and i started to work incredibly hard and i was one of those people that if i saw you working uh, sorry if, if i saw you relaxing on a weekend i think what are you doing right you lazy person mm -hmm. i thought it was all about work you know 24 7 literally uh, full on the business and i started to see different people around me you know multi-millionaires who were like just unhappy with their lives. And it was, it was quite a strange feeling. And then uh, I had a, an incident which completely shifted uh, everything that I was doing. And that's when I lost my father to suicide. Mm. And he was my best friend. I, I saw him the day before. And it completely shook my world where I started to really question, why do we do what we do? And, and what's the whole point of this? And that took me on this journey of self-discovery where I quit my business and I started to search as to, you know, what is it that really matters to people in life? So I started to go to all these different events. So Tony Robbins, Andy Harrington, like all these people across the world. And I started uh, actually going out to China. Mm -hmm. So I went to China and I started teaching neuro-linguistic programming. Uh, for those listening, it's like the patterns of the mind, like how success works and breaking it down. And, and I was out there and I just started you know, just helping people really. I started with, I think, productivity. I remember running a, running a, a seminar are in a cafe, literally like 10, 20 people. I don't think any of them spoke English, to be honest, but it was like my first sort of step yeah. into it. And then from there, I, I just started to, to build it up. And I realized that I really enjoyed helping entrepreneurs and, and they especially struggle uh, with overwhelm, isolation, because very often when you're on that journey, you, you feel like you're doing it yourself. And, and I noticed that a lot of people were really struggling with moving themselves forward. So I started to help more and more entrepreneurs and then in 2017, I had a guy come up to me and said, yeah, Ben, uh, can I do what you do? Would you teach me? And, you know, Aaron and Michael, I'm, I'm sure you'd have done the same thing. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I, and we, we laughed about it. The reason why I said that is because I, I really wasn't ready. I didn't think that it would make sense for me to teach someone yet. So yeah, yeah, three months down the line, I, I put together everything that I thought I needed. And I, I took on my first uh, sort of um, trainee, my little mini me as such. And then yeah, since then, I've, I've certified different entrepreneur lifestyle coaches to you know, speak and coach and, and really have an impact on people. And then since then, it's kind of snowballed. So I did a, I did a TED Talk in Chinese. That's pretty crazy. Wow. That was the first talk I've ever done in Chinese. And I thought I'd do on a TED Talk stage. We can dive into that a little later. And then I started to speak with big companies, HSBC, and I've you know, really expanded my speaking career. And, and I feel very fortunate that I get to help entrepreneurs from all walks of life who, as Erin was saying, struggle with procrastination, overwhelm, mm -hmm. and ultimately want to really boost their business revenue, but feel like they're getting in the way. That's so cool. It sounds like you found your clear path quickly or was it not, or was it quickly? Cause you said you did some coaching programs, Tony Robbins was, did you kind of go through a couple iterations of finding your passion? Oh, not to come iterations. That clear? <laughs> oh, constantly. I was making it up as I go along. Absolutely. I, I remember going to you know, all these different types of events, you know, everyone's saying you've got to have a niche and I'm thinking, you know, how can I have a niche? I haven't even played the game yet. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I, I, I thought it was you know, incredibly challenging, but, but I think that especially nowadays with everything that's happening, I think that no one has it all figured out. And we're constantly reiterating as we go along. And I feel very lucky that what I'm doing is very fulfilling. I, I can you know, get by doing it and, and I'm loving being able to have such an impact on, on entrepreneurs uh, from all walks of life. And, and what was that neuro learning thing that you were doing? Like, what was that all about? 
Sure. So when I went to China, I was thinking, you know, it would be great if I could learn from a coach or someone who's kind of in the industry, like a mentor, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm looking on Airbnb and I find this guy who's a master NLP practitioner. And this looks rather fancy, right? So I think, yeah. Yeah, what is NLP? I look it up and it's basically the patterns of the mind. And then what they do is they break down how successful people work and they teach you these patterns that you can then do on yourself. So I lived with this guy, Adrian, and we started to get on really, really well. And it was fantastic because I was basically living with a guy that was doing what I wanted to do. So it was great for me to just learn and, and basically take on everything that he was doing. And then I started to teach it. And basically it's you know, breaking down why we do things. So if we think about why we get stressed or why we get overwhelmed, uh, what I often do with people is I get them to teach me how to do it. All right, so I'll give you an example. So I had a, a lady who was getting incredibly overwhelmed. And when she'd get overwhelmed, she just like couldn't really do anything. She'd just like mm -hmm. sit in bed and she'd be on Netflix or she'd do something to distract herself. And, and I said, well, you know, it'd be great, Jennifer, if you could just teach me how to do this because I'm terrible at that. I've got no idea. Um, what they start to do is to become more consciously aware of the negative patterns that they go down because it's not, it, it doesn't just happen. There's some steps that they go through. So that's an example of how you use that to be able to help people move forward. So they're almost realizing what they're doing by ex having to explain it to you. Yeah, so that's a technique to make them more consciously aware of what is going on, because very often it's our unconscious patterns that ride us. So being able to take advantage of where someone is when they're in that state and have mm -hmm. them be more conscious and aware of it and then interrupting it allows someone to not go into that state so unconsciously, but actually be more aware of what they're doing. And uh, we, we just actually finished reading a book called Solve for Happy. And I feel like that it's talked briefly about stuff like this, just being aware of, you know, the negative thoughts and really it's just like your inner talk, you know, doing this to you. And that's not who you are. It's just these, you know, things are going through your mind. And it is really powerful because once you realize it, it's like, you know, at night, occasionally, you know, most times I'll sit there, watch TV and I'll be on my phone. But why am I, have, why do I have two screens? I can't digest everything that's coming in. And these are things that once you be aware of, you, you try to, stop and it's it is hard like for no doubt it's it's hard to actually realize it and then like move forward with it how are you getting people to kind of stick to that because i i feel like that was the hard part is like once you realize okay when i get overwhelmed i sit in bed and watch netflix how does that become a new habit to not do that anymore when you become overwhelmed because i think that's the the tricky part because like okay i realize like okay maybe i'm fat how do I lose weight? Like, duh, just eat better. But how do I get to that point? And I think that's the tough part. I don't know if that even makes any sense. I'm just kind of <laughs> rambling on. <laughs> sure. But there's an analogy I often give in, in, in my seminars. And I say, I, I want you to imagine that I'm an apple tree and you're a pear tree. Now, for a lot of people, they say, oh, man, I, I just wish I had that really cool apple. And, and I can stick an apple and I can put it on a pear tree. But what would happen if you stuck an apple and you put it on a pear tree? Uh, well, I don't think it would stick, but it probably wouldn't grow anymore? I don't know. <laughs> right. It doesn't stick. It falls off. And people are like, oh, that didn't work for me. Is there yeah. anything else? And I get the even, mm -hmm. even better apple, right? I can stick it on. And, and But the challenge here is that people are looking for these strategies and tactics without actually changing the fundamental part of, of who they are, right? So when I work with people, I tell them, like, it's not about just giving you all these tactics and strategies. It's about taking on the roots and realizing what are the patterns that are actually causing you to self-sabotage. Because when someone says they want to lose weight, right? I'm like, all right, cool. How long have you wanted to lose weight for? Yeah. And they're like, ah, oh, 10 years. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. great. So how's that going for you, right? Obviously, there's something wrong. It's not about yeah. the strategy and it's not difficult to lose weight, right? Yeah. All you have to do is eat less, exercise more, right? And, and, and yet there's like thousands all of all these diets yeah. and fats, right? It's pretty simple when it comes down to it. But even myself, I, I, I gained a, a ton of weight. It's a funny story. I'm, I'm going to take a little beeline here. <laughs> when I when I when I went to uh, when I went to America and and I I was with my girlfriend I was staying with um with her parents she's now my wife and uh, when I was there I was there for a month and I'm British so in British tradition you're meant to finish everything that's on your plate right now the challenge there in is America like they, they've just like tripled the plate size so already yeah. it's a challenge right but in Asian culture what they do is they like to give you more food because it's a sign of love. So I, I can't even tell you, like looking back, it's funny, but at the time I genuinely thought these people were challenging me and I was there, right? I finished my food 
And then they just give me more. And I was like, what is going on here? And it was like this battle. I felt like I was in a little war. Anyway, I ended up gaining like 30 pounds in 30 days. It was just unreal. And I, and I popped out completely. And, and the reason I'm saying that is that so when something like that happens, it then took me probably five months before I decided, okay, I'm actually going to lose this. Mm -hmm. I was complaining about it, but I didn't really do anything about it. And I think what's really important is the difference between someone wanting to do it and then someone incorporating it into like who they are. And that's, that's the person they are. I'll, I'll give an example. So when someone says that they just want to lose weight, right, that's great. But what they're, they're trying to get rid of something that they don't want. What I often do is say, okay, well, what is it that you do want? As opposed to losing weight, like, how do you actually want to feel? They want to say, okay, I want to feel healthy. Mm -hmm. I, I want to feel, you know, I, like I like my body. I, I want to be fit and I want to be able to move around. And when I talk to someone like that, I'm saying, okay, well, what would, if you were that person already, what would your life be like? Like, what would you be doing? What would be some of the habits that you'd have? And, and what you're doing is you're looking to replace different things. And what happens is it snowballs. It's not, it's not just about saying, oh, I need this strategy and stick with this diet. Like diet, the, the word is die and then a T. That's the worst thing ever. I don't want to go on a diet, right? But ultimately, I think it's a lifestyle change in hand with really figuring out who is that person that you want to be, incorporating that within you and then really integrating it so that you really refocus on it consistently. And how did you get this to become a business? Because I think a lot of people out there, you know, COVID, I mention this all the time in the podcast, but everybody's starting businesses up. How did this become your main thing? Because I think that was obviously part of your journey, but how did you realize this was actually going to be your career and a business? Sure. Well, I, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I, I basically did a life purpose course. Cause when I'm not sure, I, I literally go online. I'm like, right, someone's got to have the answer. Mm -hmm. Like there's millions of people in the world. Like, someone's got to do something. And I remember figuring out that really what I wanted to do was to help people. And I realized that uh, what I had was the, when I have this, then I will addiction. What I mean by that is when I am successful, then I will help people. Then I will inspire people. And I felt there was this prerequisite that I had to achieve before I'd help people. Now, I was lucky in that obviously that extreme circumstance of losing my dad to suicide really exponentiated that process. And then I really started to evaluate what is it that I really want. So I made a decision. I said, okay, I'm going to make this work and I'm going to find a way. So I remember starting out in China, I remember running some free events and, and literally I'd have like half people in English, half in Chinese uh, attempting to do things. And, and it's incredibly challenging, especially for example, in coaching when you first start out, because you're unsure how, how best to help people. Because very often, and I, I work with a lot of coaches now who, who want to grow their business, they're people that really care and want to give to others, but they're generally speaking aren't very business minded. And I think the big challenge that people have is they want to start a business, but it very much ends up being a hobby. And I think it's important to differentiate. Like if you want it to be a business, you have to treat it like a business and do different things. And, and very often there's a skill set or people that you need to hire to kind of fill the gaps. And I think, especially nowadays, I think there's an over-focus on creating loads and loads of content, like building amazing houses in the middle of nowhere without actually doing the marketing to actually stand out and differentiate yourself from other people to actually allow yourself to you know, have a bigger impact and also make money in the process. Yeah, it, it is It is tough because sometimes you start something and you're like, oh, this would be so cool. Like, let me do this. And then it does become that hobby because you aren't, taking it like a, taking it very seriously. You know, you're just kind of like, oh yeah, yeah, I did it like whatever. And sometimes it's even the procrastination that I think builds up because you're like, oh, like I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it, take care of it this day or whatever it is. I noticed that a lot with myself and I've just been trying to complete it instead of, oh, I'll handle the rest of that tomorrow. Because I think for me, it is so hard to you know, put all these tasks up here and like, all right, I got to get all these done. It's like, let me just finish one by one. And then slowly I can finish all these. But for the people out there that are, you know, starting their business, what are some procrastination like tactics to avoid doing that a lot? Because uh, obviously I want to know, because I don't want to. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Well, well, the first thing that I've got to say is I, I definitely think in the world we're in right now, there's an information overload, but we're starving mm -hmm. of wisdom. What I mean by that is that it's so easy to go down this rabbit hole of, okay, I want to set up a business. What is everything I have to do? And then there's thousands of articles online. Everyone says different things. And now suddenly you're in a place where you haven't got a bloody go. And yeah. I think one of the most important things is to have a mentor, have a, have a coach, have, have someone 
who has been there before and can help guide you because it just shortcuts the process. And I think you've got to do your vetting. Like you have to find someone that actually knows what they're doing as opposed to some idiot who's kind of just uh, attempting to just say it for show. Sure. And then ultimately when it comes to procrastination, when we look into you know, why do we procrastinate, very often it's because we either don't want to do the task we're doing, right? We don't have the energy for it. Or very often I see people doing things back to back to back and not having a break in the day, right? And I think that if people can you know, spend time actually breaking their day where they have breaks, they have those mini breaks throughout the day and then are very clear on exactly what they need to do, suddenly it becomes much easier. And as you mentioned, right, if you've got a list of like 50 things, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. I'd feel like a one, right? I think anyone yeah. would. And I think that's where if you have a simple focus and you actually know not only what to do, but how to do it, it makes it much easier. And I think that's where a lot of people are focusing so much on doing everything and maybe not spending enough time planning to actually understand the steps they need to take as opposed to just rushing in and kind of seeing what information's out there. And and even this year, like, you know, the beginning of the year, we, we didn't do resolutions or like what we want to achieve, but I, I wanted to think more. <laughs> Because I was doing a lot, but I wasn't thinking through the processes or thinking about what I was achieve like actually doing. It was just like get this done, get this done, get this done. But I think taking the time and think about it. And now I write these like little notes at night, just like, okay, I'm gonna do this tomorrow. Just kind of like brain dump it all. Yeah. And then I don't have to remember it. Then it's like out of my head. And I notice now just like saving things. So they're just out of my head. So then I can go back later and be like, okay, let me revisit this. Let me think about like okay, I want to, you know, we're doing a podcast. Like, what are we going to think about when we post it? Or, And it's tough because there's so many things and everything, you'd never know how long it takes. And like, you know, yeah. you, you, what were you going to say? I was going to say, do you have a, like, when business owners come to you, do they kind of know what their issue is that they're struggling with? Like, I know I'm a procrastinator or I'm overwhelmed or is it something they're just or like, do you call I, them out? <laughs> I feel stuck. Let's get to the let's get to the root of this because I really liked your approach kind of figuring out what, what we can change that's kind of built in you. And so yeah. I wonder if people even know what their problem is. Cause I, you know, I, I feel like I'm overwhelmed a lot, but sometimes I wouldn't put my finger on that or, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, realizing I have more anxiety than I thought, but I didn't know I had that. I thought I had a time management problem or something. So yeah. I feel like diagnose all that. Sure. So it's, Dr. it's ben. and then tell me what's wrong with us. <laughs> all right. So uh, welcome to diagnose this one. one Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I give an example. So there was a guy I also called Ben that, that came to me last year and he said, Ben, you know, I see how you market online. I really like it. I, I need help in marketing. Now I'm not a marketing expert, but I think, you know, I'll take the call. Let's see where this goes. So within the first five minutes, I realized his issue isn't marketing. And very often what we think the issue is, isn't the real issue, right? So I realized that he's a perfectionist, right? He's a, he's a software developer, right? He's running his company. He's got 12 employees and he's stressed out of his mind, right? He's attempting to control so many different things. He's doing these 16 hour days. He's working incredibly hard, but the challenge that he thinks he needs is to get more clients. So often when I work with someone like that, and I think this is really important when you, you know, uh, especially as you were saying, when you have a business, it's understanding what people want, saying that you can deliver what they want, but also give them what they actually need. And I think that's the two pronged approach where you say, hey, look, I've got this beautiful apple. We can make that happen. And then you deliver what's alongside that, like changing the route. So then suddenly that actually works and they can start to move forward. So in his example, he ended up downsizing his business by two. So he cut the staff, staff by two and he 10 x his business. That was unreal. It was amazing. And it's, it's things like that where someone gets out of their own way and we start to look into the relationships in his life, because very often sometimes when we look into our business, other things show up from our personal life. So if we have challenges with those close around us, if we have trust issues, if we don't, if we're a bit of a people pleaser, right? That's a huge challenge that I think a lot of people um, experience, especially as entrepreneurs, where we're attempting to please so many people and we can't say no. So there's often these different facets that I look into. And uh, over the years that I've done this, I've realized that different business owners have these lifestyle blocks. So what I do is I kind of figure out, all right, which lifestyle yeah. blocks does this person have? And then I aim to tackle them one by one uh, as they as they go through. So be it they're perfectionist, they're an over controller, they, you know, they're just a workaholic. And then by understanding exactly what they're struggling with, I can then you know, dive into what they want and then really deliver what they need at the same time. 
And is there any way that somebody at home can kind of go over this themselves and figure out, oh, you know, I'm this or I, I feel like I'm this, but maybe there's like a list of something that they can jot down to try to diagnose themselves? Because I think, you know, like for you or me, like everybody has their own different thing. And maybe I'm a procrastinator because, you know, maybe I'm overwhelmed by this and maybe Aaron's a overworker and she gets drained of energy at the end of the day. But is there anything people can do at home to kind of figure this out for themselves? Yeah, sure. So um, when I first started on this journey, right, I couldn't afford coaching. I couldn't afford diddly squat, right? And I, I came up with this uh, technique that I thought was amazing, which is called a weekly evaluation. And it's something that I share in all the seminars that I do. And when I share it, 90% of people will completely forget about it like they do with most things. 10% of people would do it and it'll completely transform what they're doing. Mm. And I came up with it when I started to look into journaling, people writing stuff down. And I started to figure out that as humans, we're just very forgetful, right? We, we kind of, we say what we want, right? And we set a New Year's resolution. Six months go by and we're like, oh shit, I actually set a New Year's resolution here. I completely forgot, right? And what I came up with is that if you ask yourself a series of questions on a weekly basis, directed at some things that you want to improve, what tends to happen is you start to become more aware of whether your actions are in line with what it is that you want. So I'll give you an example. Like if, if we use the use the losing weight one, right? Something very simple. So how have I looked after my health and how have I started to prioritize my energy this week? Mm -hmm. Right. And you're like, I did diddly squat, I had Mac Mackie D's, right? And the next week goes by and you ask yourself the same question. And so you're like, hey, I have Burger King. Okay. And suddenly it's like this little parrot in your ear being like, yo, did you do this? And then what tends to happen is you start to become more aware because it's very easy when we're in it to kind of mm. forget exactly what's happening. But on a weekly basis, I, I still do it today. I do it every Sunday. And I find it so powerful to just become more aware of what we're doing. So that, that's one strategy. Mm. I'm a huge fan of coaching. I, I think it's so powerful. And the reason why I say that is I've been coaching in so many different areas. Like when I gained that weight, I hired a health coach online because he knew what he was doing and I, I had no idea right? When I've had challenges in speaking, right? I've had a speaking coach. When, when there's all these elements, and I think that having people to help you, and, and I'll, I'll give an example, right? So uh, if I ask you both to raise your hand, uh, I know you've got mics here, but yeah, raise yeah. your hand as high as you can. Okay, I'm raising my hand as high okay, as I now, can. As high as you can, like as high as you can. Yeah. Okay. Did you see the difference there, right? I say as high as you can, you go there. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, as high, and suddenly we go up, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the difference that having that different perspective in your life has, whether that person is a coach, a mentor, or a different perspective, it allows someone to look at what you're doing in a different way. Mm -hmm. Because we all have our blind spots. I've got scotomas, everyone does. And I think having that different perspective really helps you move forward. And I wish there was something I could do that could allow everyone to have a complete diagnosis of what they're doing. But I think that's why we go to a doctor, right? If I've got a bad knee, I'm not, okay, what's wrong with my knee? I go, uh, yo, doctor, like, tell me what's up. <laughs> and and, I think that, yeah, go on, please. And how do you feel about like, because, you know, you ask your friends and stuff like that. I think sometimes, are they too close to you to acknowledge a lot of this stuff that you're, you're mentioning? Because if I went to my friends, I don't know if they would be able to like, oh yeah, Mike, like, oh, maybe you're just lazy or something. Like, you get a professional? No, I know. But I'm just saying like, don't go to you. Like, I'm trying to make a point. Like, should I not go to my friends in a way? Sure. Right. Like, I think it depends on kind of what friends you have and, and yeah. if they're honest. And I think it's also important to know that very often they're friends for a reason. Mm -hmm. They're probably not going to say, you know, hey, look, you're bullshitting yourself. You need to sort your shit out, right? Yeah. Having that different perspective is, is a little bit different than having someone who's a friend say, oh, you know, maybe you should try this Atkins diet or you should do something else, right? I, I yeah. think that there's obviously a, a difference there. And I think that's where having that outside perspective where they're not scared to tread on your toes, but really, really to say what's up. I, I think that's incredibly valuable just to just gain that insight because, I've found that my business has always plateaued and it's not my marketing that I need to improve. It's not this. It's, it's suddenly actually up leveling how I think and what I'm doing that has helped me move forward. And, and I'll share an example. So when everything was happening with COVID, I have, uh, I usually do a lot of speaking, right? So I do trips to China twice a year. I fly to LA. I fly to the UK. I, I do lots of uh, events, literally worldwide. And when COVID happened, I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'm not flying anywhere, right? I'm used to traveling literally once a month to different places. That's not happening. So now I'm in a position where most of the leads that I would get from my business would be they'd see me through speaking. 
So now I'm thinking, right, so for the next year, probably not going to get any leads from speaking. I, yeah. I'm good because I've got regular clients, but still, I, I've, I run a business. So for myself at that point in time, I, I researched online and I said, right, who is killing it in the online space? Who knows what they're doing and can teach me everything? Because I don't want to figure it out myself. And I think as business owners, it's important to shortcut the journey. So I hire myself a business coach. And the first thing that she tells me is, your brand is not going to allow you to scale online. Mm -hmm. And my original brand that I had, and this was last year, was the fulfillment artist. And it's because I helped a lot of people with fulfillment and I was helping people in different elements. But the challenge there is that when you're marketing online, you need to grab people's attention. So I started to rebrand. I did the entrepreneur lifestyle. It was horrible. It was like killing a baby. Like, I, I, was, I had this brand for years, right? It was incredibly challenging. And also putting the elements in so I could scale. So I have trainers, but I'd never really used them to teach a program. So I started to digitalize a lot of my content and I created a way to scale my business much more. And that wouldn't have come from me just thinking or reflecting that needed someone actually showing me the way, paving the path and also allowing me to think in a different way as well. And that's, it is so tough too, to hear that and be like, okay, I have to make this decision and this decision will hopefully benefit me. And that must have been a hard point. How long did it take you to decide, like, I got to change the name, I got to change the brand and tackle this different thing? Sure. So for, for me, when it comes down to decision making over the years, I've refined a process. So I go through a decision making template and I kind of figure out what I'm doing. But the first thing is that I can't get rid of one thing until I have something really solid that I believe in. I mean, that's important. It's the same with habits, right? You can't get rid of a habit unless you have something to replace it with. Yeah. So as I went through it, um, I started to, to figure out, okay, I'm going to start to move to entrepreneur lifestyle. I think that represents more of what I do, like helping business owners live a great lifestyle, boost business revenue. Like I start to feel that. And then over the course of the next three months, I started to rejig things. I started to redo branding. I started to have my videos done like much more professionally. So everything's like marketed online because I had loads of content, didn't really do much with it. I was kind of lazy. And I, I think that there's lots of people like that, but ultimately it was incredibly challenging. And, and I think that it's important that whoever you speak to as a business owner, that we all have our challenges. And I think that for me being able to do that, we can question ourselves, is this the right thing? Am I not sure? And we can never be 100% sure. What I do is I say, look, this is my best shot for right now. I'm going to give this a go. If it doesn't work, I'll know. If it does, great. And then if it doesn't, you know, I can reevaluate. But I think you've got to really go for it. And I see too many entrepreneurs and going back to your procrastination and why people get overwhelmed. I see too many people taking decisions on thinking about it for a long time and mm -hmm. not being able to take action and leaders make decisions fast and change them slow. And I think that's where business owners really need to dig deep and just make more decisions and fast so that they have less on their plate and can really move forward. Yeah. On that note, it kind of reminds me of what you were saying earlier um, about setting your goals and just reminding yourself weekly of what you're focused on. So we just read, I, he said, we read this together. We kind of read books simultaneously, but we both read. Well, one after another. She's yeah, like, oh, this was good. We don't read it together. But, yeah. um, <laughs> like, oh, tonight, Aaron. <laughs> uh, you're going a bit quick. I'm, I'm still on page 70 here. <laughs> yeah, but it's nice because then we can kind of remember and implement some more things. But I recently read The 12 Week Year and it's yeah. very similar to what you said, just checking in weekly. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, this does work. And it reminds me of my three focuses for this 12 week year. Um, but I'm wondering like timing wise, like sometimes you're like, as, as a business owner, you make quick decisions like six months in or six weeks into my quote 12 week year. I'm like, maybe this one of these goals isn't what I should be working on. Are there any like signs that you can like, obviously talking to your coach can help, but like, how would you know if, you know, you're still checking in on this thing every week, but maybe it's still not the right direction change it. Um, to change it. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, like my is. Is open to change a lot, but I feel like I would just like keep going at something and maybe for too well, long. It was funny because. Aaron and myself are so different where Aaron does ponder questions a lot. And I just like, just do something and then we'll see if it's bad. Then we'll don't, won't do it anymore, but I at least want to know. And I, I like tinkering and trying all this different stuff out because I don't know. I don't know any better. And like, I more have a fear yeah. of like doing it wrong. And I want to make sure we're like doing, you know, so I'm slower <laughs> to adopt new things. Dr. Ben, help us. Yeah, you got the balance there. This, this is probably why it's working out, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think ultimately, and I, I very much agree with the 12-week year. I, I work in power years with, with my clients. So, you know, three months, that's the year. Mm -hmm. oh, I don't do calendar year goals because yeah. I think that's like, because 
you know, a calendar year goal. I mean, we go back to 20, uh, 20, uh, 2020, right? You set a calendar year goal. Like, where was that in February? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, suddenly you've got to reevaluate. Totally so right. on, on Aaron's point, whenever there's a, a, a goal that I have, now, I'll, I'll actually give you a, a, an example um, th that I had, uh, I think it was in September. So in September, I was looking into the different priorities I have in my business. And I think that it's very important, and I, and I, I tell this to everyone that I work with, is you have a major, like this is your major focus for this quarter. So there's, there's these like three months, there's power year, there's 12 week year, that's your major focus and you have a few minors. And the challenge that I had is that I am constantly working on my Chinese, but I'm also you know, revamping my business and I'm you know, working incredibly hard at that. And I had this challenge of, okay, I can attempt to keep my Chinese on point, but I also am doing this in my business. And I felt this internal conflict of, I wasn't sure exactly what to focus on. Mm -hmm. So what I did, and, and, and I say, say this to everyone, is that you need to have some sort of decision-making template that you go through. So for myself, it's figuring out, okay, what are my most important outcomes right now? Then you go through, okay, maybe it's to make more money. Maybe it's to have a bigger impact. Maybe it's to feel more grounded. Maybe it's to have more time, whatever those are. And you clarify all those outcomes. But then you're going to look at all the options you have available. I could do uh, more Chinese. I could focus on outreach. I could hire a couple more marketing people. I could focus on my marketing in China, right? There's loads of different options. And then you start to look into all the pros and cons. And, and this is something where it takes time. And this is where for bigger decisions, I go through a process like this. And I start to go through all those steps and I can see everything visually and kind of figure out what is the best option right now and mitigate the risks. For other things, if I'm feeling unsure, I'm like, right, right, is this the right thing for me or not? And that's where you kind of got to trust your gut and not just rattle through because if you're trying to put a square peg in a round hole, it's just not going to work, right? Yeah. And I think that's where you've got to have that balance. And that's why I do think, you know, having a business partner, having someone beside you is important so you can really figure out, okay, let's reevaluate do I want to do this or shall I switch perspectives and pivot the business and pivot what we're doing right now and then kind of reevaluate in a few months time? Yeah, it definitely helps to have someone to bounce your ideas off, whether it's co-founder or yeah, I can't imagine doing it alone. So I would, yeah, definitely always recommend having a co-founder or a coach or somebody. Or a coach. Yeah, it's, it could get because it could get lonely as an entrepreneur and, you know, you, you know, you're overthinking stuff sometimes. So definitely yeah. be able to to bounce off helps. Um, so I'm dying to hear your call me crazy story, Ben. Um, and if you could throw in any like chi like Chinese phrases, like maybe how you say ch call me crazy in Chinese. I'm really impressed that you know let another language, let alone Chinese. We, um, yeah, I've tried to learn a couple languages and it's tough. So um, if you want to incorporate that somehow, great. But we want to hear a time when you made a decision and, you know, you were called crazy for it, but you were happy that you went that route. And here you are today even better. Oh, wow. Too many stories to break down. Just give us a Chinese lesson. Uh, no, I, I, I'll, I'll go with the Chinese TED talk because I think that's a little bit different than what most people expect. Um, so well, I, I've been teaching TED talks for about, uh, well, now about five, six years. And two years ago, I, I was chatting to one of the organizers and I said, I, I want to do the TED talk in Chinese. And she says, Ben, your Chinese isn't good enough to be able to do a TED talk. And do you have any idea what, you know, like there's 400 people, you're, yeah. it's like 19 minutes straight, like you, you, you need to like do it. And I said, let's give it a go. And after I said that, I was overwhelmed. I was down in myself. So I think, holy moly, like what am I doing? Like this is actually a, a, a bit of a venture. Like I can speak English, like, fine, that's easy, but in a different language. And I think the, the real challenge I had was I can speak in a different language, but how am I going to do this? Am I going to recite it? Yeah. Am I going to like try and go on the whim and improve my language in three months? Like I really had no idea. And obviously on top of this, I'm not running my business, right? So uh, as I started to go through this, I, I get myself a Chinese teacher. I'm obviously not attempting to do this myself. And I write the whole thing in English. And I start to translate with her, literally sentence by sentence, oh, kind God. of what I'm going for, right? And as I start to trans, like translate sentence by sentence, we're just going back and forth because sometimes she doesn't get the meaning. I'm like, I don't want to say that. That sounds horrendous. And she's like, you can't say that in Chinese. It doesn't make sense. I'm like, well, what do I do? So we're going back and forth. And then by the time I kind of figure this thing out, it's just a huge, massive document with all these different things on. And then there's, in Chinese, there's these characters, right? So as opposed to just with other languages, you can just read them. In Chinese, there's like thousands of different characters. So now I've got these things. And I'm thinking, I don't even know what that freaking means. I don't even say yeah. that. 
right? So then I'm like on Google, I'm trying to translate. And then the challenge with Chinese, and I think this is probably the hardest part, is that the way in which you say a word changes the meaning, right? And, and we, we can't mm. really fathom it when we speak English, right? Yeah. I'll give you an example, okay? So if I went my and my, right? It's just me, like, that, that sounds the same, right? But yeah. that is buy and sell. Like, like that, how does that make sense? Wow. Right? So buy is like the way, like that intonation and then my is sell. The challenge wow. is when you're doing a talk, you have all these words that string together with different tones. And if you say something oh wrong, God. it can be completely misconstrued, right? <laughs> I remember one of my friends having an argument with someone uh, in China because he was trying to buy something, but the person thought he was trying to sell him his own product. And he was like, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> so it's incredibly challenging. And I'm starting to go through this, a month goes by, and I'm thinking, like, uh, this is this is probably looking pretty challenging. And I ha I've got a practice coming up, I kind of read it, and they go, you know, Ben, it's, I mean, if you read it, it's okay, but there's quite a lot of work. Right. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, I, I need to dig deep. So I started to look into condensing it and to figure out how could I really learn this in a way that would work. So I realized that I'm just going to have to memorize the whole thing. Or I'm just going to have to memorize the whole speech and just, we're just have to give it a go. So anyway, as I start to go I through I don't know this, what it means. I'm, I, no, no. <laughs> Say the sounds. Right, so, so, so the challenge is I've, I'm, I'm literally memorized this entire thing, but now the sentences just don't work because I'm like reciting it. I'm, I'm like a robot just going through it. And I remember doing uh, swimming lengths, right? And I was swimming lengths and I was literally reciting this entire TED talk as I'm swimming. I'm like, rewards, I need a shang huo zhong, yo yi wei yi shang. Like, it's, it's just ridiculous, right? So as I start to go through this, this process, it gets to about uh, literally three weeks before for. And when I teach speaking, I say that most of what you say, the audience isn't even going to remember. It's about how you say it. It's about your body language. It's about the emotions that they experience. So now I have the even bigger challenge, which is how do I become emotionally connected to the words that I say? And how do I match the body language? And when I started, I remember going, there's five points. And then I put five up like that, right? It just wasn't like signaling. So it just looked very weird. And then as the weeks went on, they were thinking, you know, Ben, maybe you can do it, maybe you can't. I was like, let's just do it. We'll see how it goes. And I remember standing there on the day, uh, having the, the TED stage, and as everyone chatting in Chinese, obviously they're Chinese speakers, and then a couple of people doing it in English. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? And I remember standing up there, looking out, and I saw everyone, or like all the white people, putting on headphones to translate what I'm saying. And I'm thinking, this is pretty funny. And as I'm up there, I literally get in my groove, I start going, and halfway through my speech, right? Only my you won't believe this. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, no. Right? So, so just imagine this, right? I'm in front of hundreds of people, okay? And I've just gone blank, like diddly squat. And I'm, I'm thinking, like, in my head, I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? I'm on stage, right? And I look at a member of the audience. And uh, in Chinese, I say, you know, what am I going to do? Like, woman's in my bum. And this poor little Chinese go, but just goes like, like, like this, right? He's got no idea. And it gave me just enough time to remember what I was saying. And then I managed to finish my speech. And uh, oh, I mean, we can put a link in the show notes. You guys can check it out. It's got subtitles. Yeah, and that was definitely. probably the uh, the craziest uh, challenge that I've done in, in the past couple of years. But there's a lot of others as well. Wow. That's that's wild. I'm, I'm impressed that you remembered it all because I can barely remember like a, a phrase or something that's like, oh, retype this phrase into your email or, you know, when you're verifying <laughs> that's something. In English? And that's in English. <laughs> I could only imagine that. But. Congrats on that. I'm excited to watch it. We'll definitely put it in the show notes so everybody can uh, watch it as well. Uh, entrepreneurial Lifestyle, ben-ivy.com. All the info's there, right? People can contact you on the website. Yeah, sure, they can get in contact with me. All I mean, right. we're in digital. I mean, if they can't contact me there, I don't think there's any hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ben, it was great having you on, and we appreciate you taking the time out today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was a pleasure. It was lovely to connect with you, and thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Likewise. All right.